No, uh, first of all, I want to, to thank the organizers for inviting me for attending this training school. Uh, and <coughs> well, as Apostolo said, uh, I'm working in the Fundación CEAM. This is the Center for Environmental Studies in the Mediterranean. Uh, the headquarters are in Valencia, here in eastern Spain. Uh, I, I am I'm working in offices at the University of Alicante, uh, at the, a little bit more uh, to the south. Uh, this is the, our center in Valencia, and we have, well, this is environmental resource center, and we have four different departments. This is atmospheric pollution, air pollutant effects, meteorology and climatology, and forest research. That is where I work. Well, the, the scope of our research is environmental is issues that are concerned to our region and in extension to the whole Mediterranean basin. Okay, uh, my idea is to, to the structure of the, of the talk. First of all, uh, I want to do some mm, revision of general concepts dealing with restoration. For sure, th those concepts has, have, have already been uh, arise during these, these days, this training school, but I prefer to, to go fast uh, again on them. And then uh, I will discuss some techniques, some eco-technologies that uh, we in our group have developed and also uh, um, but they are common in, in, in other places uh, that have the same problems that, that we have. Okay, in, in, in any case, if you want to establish a discussion in any point, feel free to do it, okay? Well, uh, I also like to, to start with some images that uh, highlight that restoration is possible. These are some examples. The, this one is in, in southeastern Spain, uh, Sierra Espuña. This is now a natural park. The other one is in Limba, in Sardinia. So these are uh, classical restoration examples, or this one in, in, in South France, where this highly degraded land became this. So this is just some pictures to illustrate that there is a hope, that we have to find out how to do it, okay? Of course, time has changed a lot because when these restoration plots uh, projects started, things are completely, things were completely different. Okay, some, some general concepts about restoration. Uh, restoration is an alteration of a site aimed at establishing a native historical given ecosystem. So the, the, the objective is to, <coughs> to mimic the structure, the functioning, the diversity and the dynamics of the ecosystem. This is the, 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 the theoretical concept of restoration applied to ecosystems or environment. Rehabilitations. This is the reparation of ecosystem processes, probably not to mimic the same original structures. Okay? So there are some small differences. They are semantic, but they are. Reclamation mostly applies to, to queries or to open mining. And mitigation, the action intended to compensate environmental change, uh, environmental uh, damage. Okay. Well, this, this uh, graph represents the classic model of Bradshaw and Shodwick. I don't know if you are, uh, you, well, you know it. The idea is to relate ecosystem functioning and ecosystem structure. And if we have an original ecosystem, healthy ecosystem, with high structure and high functioning, this, this uh, the, the, the accumulation of stresses or, or the occurrence of different disturbances can take this original and healthy ecosystem to a point where the uh, structure and uh, functioning of the ecosystem are rather low, okay? And from this point is where secondary succession starts working and the natural, natural trajectory should be this one, should. But the question is that, for several reasons, this 
uh, trajectory of, of recovery of, of services and, and functioning can, uh, can be stopped. Okay, so the idea, this is just to an example, if this represents our degraded ecosystem, this statue, the main goal would be to recover it completely, the same one. But if this is not possible, we have some other alternative states with similar function. We have recovered probably a good functioning of the original ecosystem. This is not the same, but behaves very similar. Okay? So this, uh, many, many times, this represents stable states too. Okay? Okay. Well, the, the, well, this is the definition of restoration ecology, uh, defined by the International Society for Ecological Restoration. It's the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. So the idea is to help the ecosystem. External inputs to help what the ecosystem by itself cannot do. Well, I think we all agree that the ecosystem functioning and, and structure uh, uh, may vary, will change in a, a gradient of increasing stress, of course. But now we know that this relationship is not linear. I know, we know that the relationship is like in steps, different steps, okay? The question is that the ecosystem has the ability to cope with a certain degree of stress without major changes. But when the, the threshold, the, the stress thres threshold uh, arrives, the ecosystem collapses. Collapses, losing whatever, functioning or structure. Hmm? And then again, it starts another period where the, the ecosystem can uh, withstand some more stress, okay? Ideally, uh, conceptually, we have these two thresholds. One controlled by biotic, uh, biotic relationships, and the second one controlled by abiotic ones. When the ecosystem goes beyond those thresholds, natural recovery is unlikely. So that's when ecological restoration should be included and incorporated into the management of the, of the sites. Well, this, this slide represents the same, but with uh, another, uh, in another way. No? The, in increasing degradation, when in a healthy ecosystem, the primary processes are fully functional, even in this range of degradation, but when the threshold, the first remember, biotic threshold arrives, some primary processes are mm, damaged, but are still functional, but not beyond the, the uh, abiotic threshold. So the action, both actions should be applied in every case. In the first one, the recovery only requires improved management of plant removal or damage, just removing the damage of the, or the disturbance, uh, but the, the, the ecosystem will, will recover. If the first threshold has been uh, uh, overpassed, then some vegetation manipulation, manipulation is required. And in the case of the, that the abiotic threshold has been overcome, then it is needed to do some physical uh, environment manipulation, okay? Now, this is a graph that I like a lot uh, because uh, relates the success of the restoration action, whatever, with, well, this, this is a problem. Well, this is, this, this in, the X, in the X axis, it is the stress, accumulation of stress, and this is inputs in the, in the Z axis, okay? So the idea, of course, is that the higher the stress present in a, in a particular site, the lowest 
the probability of success of any restoration measure. And the, the, those sites that has a, a low uh, disturbance history or disturbance stress, well, it is very likely to recover with uh, restoration actions. But the question is this, this third axis, is how the technological effort, the technological inputs, money, could improve this probability of success of the restorations in highly or low, lowly degraded site. Of course, if we have a, a low degraded site, as the probability of success is high, you don't have to invest a lot in technologies and in, in, in these uh, new uh, methodologies. But in the case that your, uh, your site, your plot, is highly disturbed or, or, or highly stressed, uh, there is a range of uh, ecotechnological eco tools and actions that could improve largely the probability of success. Okay? So this is where we should focus, here and not here. This is easy. So the, the challenge is the right side of the graph. Well, this is again the objectives of restoration. To try, we try to recover the integrity of the ecosystem uh, when the degradation thresholds have been overcome. And the objectives mainly are related to biodiversity, carbon sequestration and air storage, controlling erosion and water cycles, and also uh, socioeconomical issues. But one interesting thing is that the objectives of the restoration has, have changed a lot in the last, let's say, decades. For instance, in Spain, uh, a lot of large afforestation has, uh, have been done during the, the mid of the, of the uh, 20th century. And the main objective was to fix population on rural areas. To, so the, the idea was to, to create employ in, in those rural depra deprived areas. So, but now these objectives have changed. Now uh, society is demanding other things different from the environment and not exactly the same as some time ago. But we, we should aware also that the complete recovery of the ecosystem is probably and in many cases impossible. We, we have to know this. Okay, and ecotechnologies, another definition, applied science that integrates the study fields of ecology and technology. Okay. The idea is to improve the environment by minimizing the impacts and maximizing sustainability. And the objectives, main objectives, are the restoration of disturbed ecosystem by human activities. This is important to human activities. Ecotechnologies also uh, mainly applied to, uh, to sites that have been degraded by man. All of them. <laughs> and also the development of new sustainable ecosystems and with new values. Well, those tools that uh, have been developed to enhance the rehabilitation on, in, in drylands have been focused on first improve the ability of the planted seedlings to withstand stressful environmental conditions, to reduce predation and improve microsites micro -size and resource availability. Oh, what happened here? Well, it, it was supposed to have letters inside. So this was, for instance, I don't remember exactly, organic amendments. This is an ecotechnological eco tool. Um, is, you can see mycorrhization, but mycorrhization is the, the next talk, so I will not talk about it. Tree shelters, mulching, microenvironment uh, uh, alteration, so site preparation, um, hydrogels, and I forgot the last one, sorry. 
So the idea is there are several, several different ecotechnological eco tools that are, uh, are specific to several problems. So we have to select which is the problem and which is the, uh, the technique available to fight against this problem. And again, uh, we have also to, to know well what are the, the constraints that are difficult in the establishment of restoration actions. And in the Mediterranean conditions, we, we have a lot of different things that have been acting for many times and also some physical features that constrained this, this uh, success of restoration. For instance, climate, we for sure have a summer drought. This is very highly predictable that we are going to face drought maybe next month on. But also there is other out of season droughts that are less predictable, but they are going to be very important in, the, uh, rest, in, in, in defining the restoration success. Also the soils. The soils, in general, they are shallow, stony and discontinuous, poor structured, also prone to surface sealing and crusting and you know that soil sealing and crusting uh, affect water infiltration and then the whole uh, hydrological cycle could be affected. Also they are poor in fertility, nutrients and organic matter, also could be uh, and, and uh, difficult for, for the establishment of, of new seedlings. And this is very important too, the disturbance regime. Uh, the disturbance regime, here I put fire, recurrent fire. Fire is a natural agent. The problem of fire is the frequency of fires, not the, the occurrence of one single fire every 100 years. The problem is to having, having two or three uh, fires in the same site in 20 or 30 years. Or grazing. Grazing is a, a land use very common, especially here in Greece. Uh, and this is, we have to manage with it. The problem is overgrazing, not, not grazing. Or the extreme climatic event. In general, land use should be also uh, uh, another point that should be considered in, in these constraints for the restoration of, of Mediterranean drylands. Well, this is again, I, I, I go on this. And another uh, guest to this picture is climate change. So all the, the models, all the, the predictions uh, foreseen an increase of annual temperature and a decrease in, in precipitation in the Mediterranean, in the whole Mediterranean. These are the annual increase in temperature. Uh, I think this is in relation to 1990 and the, the forecast for uh, 2000, I don't know, I think it's 2000, 20, 20, 21,000. Uh, <coughs> this is an increase in temperature in January, or oh, sorry, in, in winter, and this in, in, in summer. Well, look that in summer it is expected to have an increase in the Mediterranean basin around 4 degrees. This is huge. This is the, an average of 20, 21 different models. And the, the reduction in precipitation is, is also around 15-20%. Uh, so these are scenarios that we should include in our analysis. Okay because this is going to modify the distribution of species, of plant species, okay? If, if climate is going to change here, some, some plant species cannot cope with this, uh, with this uh, environmental change. And for instance, the stability of higher plants by 2050 will decrease a lot. And for two, there are two hot two hotspots here in the Iberian Peninsula in southern France and in the north of the Black Sea, only around 30% of the species is expected to be stable by 2050. 
and also is the, how the diversity of these areas is going to be affected. Well, we have this from southern Finland to northern Poland that uh, around 75% of the species in 2050 will be new. Okay, so uh, these are models, of course, the, there are some uh, uh, expectations, but uh, these are some arguments that we have included in our study. Well, <clears throat> let's go. Any question right now? No? Everything's clear? Well, well, as you can see above, seedling mortality. Let's see now, this is our main target. If we are doing restoration, we are trying to, to uh, increase the species, the individual, the plant individuals and the plant species present in a given site. And the most common uh, action is by planting. Not only, but uh, the most common thing is planting seedlings. And this is one of the things that, well, the, the main things I'm going to, to, to discuss here. So, seedling mortality after planting, there are different uh, bottlenecks. First of all, at the very short term, we have first a transplant shock shortly after, after being planted because the seedlings produced in the nurseries should be unbalanced, so probably a lot of above ground biomass and roots poor developed. Also because adverse field conditions, that it is common, as we have seen before, there are uh, climatic conditions uh, that could be faced after, after planting, poor red, root development, etc. And also the summer drought. Okay, so there are two things. Transplant shelf and then a drought period soon after planting. This, well, I think there are some more. This is this uh, first bottleneck of seedling establishment. But there are also at the longer term mortality. But in this case, it's associated to uh, some let's say, extreme climatic events like drought and an increase of temperature. The idea is that once the, the, the seedlings have developed uh, a good root system, the, it is unlikely to, to get, uh, uh, to recover high mortality of the seedlings. But sometimes could happen. This is, for instance, in, a, in 2005, we have a, a, a serious, a very serious drought in Spain. And this is a Pinus alapensis. You know that Pinus alapensis is very, uh, is a species very common in, in afforestation and restoration. And it is uh, low uh, water demanding, low demanding of also soil properties and, and nutrient, but however, uh, in a combination of high temperatures and low water availability, even they have been established for uh, two years, you can, uh, they, can, they can die. So this, this uh, main, uh, uh, the main reason uh, controlling seedling mortality is the length at the short term is the length of the drought period after planting. Of, this is what, what we meant with the uh, drought period. This is the consecutive days without an effective rainfall. Effective rainfall around higher than five liters per square meters. And this, this represents what we observe in, in different experimental plots that we established in those years, in 1992 and 1993, and the mortality rate during the first year. So, seedlings that face it around five months of, without no effective rain, 
died during the first year around 80%, even more, even 100%, okay? And so, and the, the lower the drought period, the higher the seedling survival, or the, the lower the, the seedling mortality, okay? So the idea, the development of ecotechnological eco tools should be focused on break, breaking this drought period, okay? Well, however, uh, although many uh, side, uh, well, many treatments applied in the field have uh, significant positive effects, they represent only a small part of the variance of, of uh, seedling survival. Look at this, the, this black part of the, of the bars represent the effect of the site. So these are particular site-specific conditions that are controlling seedling establishment. And these black small pieces of the bars represent the treatment, although they are significant in many cases, okay? And some residuals. The question is that with treatments, well, the, and this represents seven different experiments that we found on the, on the bibliography. Uh, the question is that the, the site component uh, determining uh, seedling establishment is very high. But however, we can also work with this site component and apply uh, again our treatments. Well, <clears throat> now, one, one thing that I want to highlight also is the species selection. The species selection, in order to what traditionally has been done, at, at least in, in some parts of the Mediterranean, like planting monospecific uh, species, um, well, planting uh, only one or two single species in large parts of, uh, of the territory. Now, uh, fortunately, the, the scope of the, uh, and the, the objectives of increasing biodiversity in many parts have opened the, 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 the selection of species and much more species, not only trees, are being included in the restoration works. Uh, but when we are looking for uh, the se species selection, we have go beyond the name of the species and go to the life traits of this species. For instance, if we are aware that water availability is, one, is going to be one of the first key points for the establishment of the, of the success of the restoration, we, we should look for what is the water use strategies of the species that we select, okay? So let's say that there is a range of different uh, abilities of, of a species relating to the uh, ecophysiology and the, the, well, how they behave with the water, water loose. Also the root development, this is critical too, because if, again, if water is the main limiting factor, uh, plants take water by the roots. So it is mandatory to look for what happens with the roots and how can we promote an early development of very good and structured root systems. Hmm? Well, there are, these are life traits. There are some species with shallow rooting systems and some others like Kirkus species with uh, deep roots. And this has a, a, a very um, significant correlation with the, the maximum rooting depth with the ecophysiology of the plant. The higher, sorry, the, well, the, the, the deeper the, go, the roots go, the higher the uh, transpiration and assimilation of the seedlings. Okay. And the eco, ecophysiological uh, behavior or performance, let's say, is very dependent of the development of new roots soon after planting. So it is, it is crucial that once 
that we plant a seedling in the field, those uh, below ground systems start growing and colonizing the soil surrounding and beyond. <coughs> well, this, this graph just represents how is the relation between plant, uh, uh, potential water, uh, plant water potential and soil moisture mm, in uh, three plant species, Pistacea dentiscus, Juniperus oxycedrus, and Kercus coccifera, all three shrubs, at the three months and one year later. Okay, so let's look at, the, uh, look at this water potential, are very low, very negative. So this represents that the plants are very stressed. Half the plant has to do a lot of pressure to take water from the, from the soil. And this even with soil moisture around 6, 7 or 8 percent. What happened? One year later, once the roots have developed and has gone beyond, this, this represents the uh, length of new roots. Uh, it, this is in, in, in April and this is one year later. So the development of new roots, although the, the has, has, uh, has made possible that the water potential of the plant is much higher, so less pressure needed to get the water, even with lower soil, uh, soil water contents. Well, fortunately, uh, we are doing things and we are getting things. Uh, in our region, um, the, the, the management of the rangeland, of the forest and of the degraded lands uh, relies on the forest services of the of the administration and they own several forest nurseries and when we started working well there's no 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 figure here but for instance in 2001 the nursery the public nurseries in in our region produce less than 10, 10 species less than 10 species uh, most of them well, I think all of them were trees hmm? and with time with time we have improved not we the, 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 the system have improved we, we, we are we are in good permanent communication with the, the forest services and they have included the production of other plant species not only trees there are a lot of shrubs being produced there and even grasses because some places need grasses for being restored, okay? And now, well, we, we, we reached a top, uh, the, the highest of 25 species, different species. This, this nursery is very, very small one, so it is a, a lot of, and then it starts declining. Guess why? Crisis, sure. Okay, now, seedling quality. Well, this really uh, starts with some eco-technologies, but not in the field. These are technologies for the production of seedling. This is the first, the first uh, step in the restoration. We have to produce the seedlings. This is not the, the nursery I said before. This is another one, but also public one. <clears throat> well, uh, traditionally, uh, the, the seedling quality concept has been uh, uh, has been identified with the, seedling, the size of the seedlings, and this has has been uh, has been uh, said especially for conifers. Hmm? Uh, in case that the the higher the the seedling, the higher the probability of success in the field. Well, there are some evidence that could be true. If this is the case, the case of, of Aleppo pine in dry subhumid, not in semi-arid. But there are others like Kirkus and especially shrubs that there is no relationship between the size of the, of the plant and the behavior or the performance in the field. However, the, the, the height and the, I think the root collar diameter they are, uh, they are variables that are included in the directives of seedling quality. <clears throat> but we can handle and we can 
uh, we can modify the quality of the seedlings in the, in the nursery by changing the, con the size of the containers, the substrates, and by the application of hardening treatments. Hardening, uh, well, drought, drought hardening is, uh, is focused to, uh, to produce seedlings much more adapted to drought that they are going to face in the field. Take into account that if you are a seedling and you are in a forest nursery, you have a lot of food, a lot of water, a lot of shade sometimes, whatever you want. You are in the paradise. And then suddenly you are picked up, you are, uh, you are transported in a, in a truck, you go to the field and some, someone puts you in a, a stressful conditions in something you don't, you have to fight for your water, you have to fight for your food, uh, you have to do everything that you are not uh, used to do. From heaven to hell. Exactly, <laughs> from heaven to hell. Um, so that's the idea. So it is uh, logical to think that if you apply some uh, stressful conditions before planting the seedlings, the seedlings are preconditioned to the field conditions. Okay. Well, and you can do by regulating drought, sorry, by regulating water availability, or by regulating fertilization nutrients. This is the case uh, of water preconditioning, drought preconditioning of Kirkus Suber seedlings. That this is a normal one with traditional uh, fertilization and traditional uh, irrigation. Look at the development of the above ground biomass. And this is one where you have, they, they reduce the, the irrigation during I don't remember, I think it was around two months before planting, but I'm not completely sure. Sometime before planting, okay? The first uh, evidence is very clear. There's an adjustment of the morphology. Hmm? This is a much more balanced seedlings. And then, eco ecophysiologically, plants are also more adapted to water uh, limitation. And this has some translation to the survival of the th of seedlings in the field. Okay. This is the the black one is the preconditioned seedlings and the control, the the control, of course. Uh, again, differences. When occur the differences at the beginning? That's where we are uh, always trying to modify the behavior of the seedlings shortly. This is the key, uh, the key period where ecotechnologies and whatever we, we try to do uh, should be focused to uh, improve. And these are other examples of uh, um, hardening, but from the nutritional point of view, of, in this case are uh, shrubs in, and planted in semi-arid sites. The black bars are the standard fertilization, traditional, and the gray ones are with deprivation of nutrient during the uh, fall. Okay. So these are nitrogen uh, stressed plants before planting. And well, not in all cases are significant the differences, but there are some improvement on the performance and the behavior of these seedlings in the fields uh, if they are um, hardened nutritionally. Okay. So the second thing I mentioned was the, the container size, the size of the containers. Uh, this of, of course applies only to containerized plants, no bare root seedlings. And, and this is especially important for uh, a species that has as a life trait the production of a long tap root, like Kerkus species. These deeper or larger containers improve rot colonization, 
makes longer pivot roots, increase the rooting depth after planting, increase water transport capacity, and increase the number and biomass of roots in deeper layers. Uh, think that deeper layers are more probably to store higher water contents. Okay? So it is important trying to develop not uh, roots, shallower roots, that also they can have, uh, they, they could be very effective in short pulses of, of water, but deeper soil horizons uh, uh, represent more, how say, constant, uh, a, a constant pool of water. Well, again, the, the black bar is the, the deeper container and the gray bar is the, the normal traditional container. So, well, let's say this is th three months after planting and this is 18 months after planting. So, uh, um, 18 months after planting, we dug the, the, the planting holes and recover all the, the root system, all possible root systems by different layers. And let's say that the control ones, the traditional containers, develop most of the root systems in shallower uh, soil horizons uh, around in the first 20 centimeters of soils. And the deeper containers have large proportion of roots in, uh, in, in, deeper, in deeper soil horizons, okay? And this is very important to, uh, to assure the uh, survival of the seedlings. This graph is a little bit complicated, but just represents, this is the, the rooting depth of the seedlings, the black bar. Yeah, okay, rooting depth. Uh, the different colors are soil moisture of the different layers and this line represents the seedling survival. So we, we can appreciate uh, seedling mortality when the roots don't reach deeper uh, moisture soil uh, profiles. But if the roots reaches to these moisture, pro uh, moisture soil horizons, the, the survival of the seedling is almost complete. Well, um, what about the substrates to, to produce the seedlings? Normally, most of the substrates are based on peat. And peat is a very good material, but has some problems. Uh, if, if, if the peat dries, it is very difficult to rehydrate again this, this substrate. So one alternative could be the use of hydrogels or clays to improve this, the water status of the seedlings in the nursery. Uh, in this case, we prove HS is a hydrogel stochosorb. I don't know, well, it's a commercial. Uh, mix it with, I, I focus on this, uh, mix it with, uh, with peat and, and the proportion 1.5% uh, uh, of hydrogel in the total volume of the container. The question is that it increases both, uh, especially this proportion of hydrogel and these are clays, uh, particular clays, increases the water content of the substrate and reduce it the water potential, oh, sorry, increase it the, rooted, uh, uh, the water potential of the seedling. Take into account that this is a minus. Water potential is always in negative signs. And decrease also the discriminant in 13 carbon of the, of the plants. This just means that the seedling has water enough for spending. Okay, so this is not much water use efficiency. It's the inverse of water use efficiency, but the plant doesn't need to be efficient because they, it, it, it has enough water.
Well, <coughs> and in the field, in the field, this is another experiment with this, the same, the same uh, proportion of the. Well, in fact, it's the same experience, but the part in the field with Kirkus Suber, and there was an, uh, a, a trend, a significant trend to increase seedling survival in the field even to two years after after planting. And this other graph represents what how behave the the seedlings during a drought cycle, a complete drought cycle of 30 days. In this case are Pistachia lentiscus and Kirkusilex, two other species, but with the same uh, uh, proportion. I think this is only 1%, not 1.5% of hydrogel. Okay? The question is, in, in both species, there was a, a delay in the in seedling mortality when subjected to a drought cycle. So you, you are providing some days, don't know much, but some days to the seedlings in order to overcome this water stress and to, to revert the environmental conditions. And finally, this is another example of uh, uh, the, the, the difference with this uh, experiment is well, Pinus pinea, I think. Yeah, Pinus pinea. And the question is that they apply the hydrogel hydrated, so with water. So this is not very, very comfortable to manage in the field because there are large volumes that you, volumes and weight that you are uh, transferring to the field. But however, the well, the different. In, it also, this is also a drought cycle of 60 days, uh, and the differences are are very clear. So the the water potential drops a lot in the control in the control seedling. But not always these, uh, these uh, treatments uh, or this treatment don't have the same effects in everywhere and every species. These examples are from Kirkus rubra, not very, not very common in drylands, but however. And um, they uh, compare the use of hydrogel and, and control seedlings in two different situations under well water conditions and in other conditions where the seedlings were water stressed. The difference what, well, what we are really interested is in the water stressed conditions. No? Because if the conditions are good, you don't need an improvement. But in water stressed conditions, there was, this is this, this line, this gray one, there's no difference in any of these above and below ground components of the plant. So this, again, is the part of, this, of the graph I show you where the, the, the side effect was very large. OK, how are you? <laughs> Everything is OK? Can we continue? No, no continue? Yeah? May I have a question? Yeah, sure. The size. Size of the root because of the shortage of water in the soil and some droughts. Hmm. Uh, what, because of your experience, what's your idea? We can consider the size of the root and distribution of the root as a one uh, index to show the aridification. Hmm. Uh, aridification, I don't know. Um, for sure, you have to include both the the well the, the maximum rooting depth and also the the, the proliferation of, of, of roots in, in the the complete profile of the soil but um, it is going to depend on the species I think the, the component of the the specific component is very important in, uh, and is going to determine what is better if uh, a very deep tap root uh, or deeper type root with very few uh, lateral shallower ones or the opposite. So a very um, huge uh, biomass in, in shallower horizons. It, and also it's going to depend on the climatic 
um, the, the climate, climate regime of the, of the area. Because if you have some few and no, some common rain events that goes and, 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 and moist the shallower centimeters of the soil, probably you need shallower uh, roots. So I, I think it is not a, a, a unique uh, universal answer to this, but we, sh we should focus on, on the species and on the sites. Hmm? You mentioned it was this place, uh, the texture is very finer. Uh, do you find any this hot pan effect on the soil? Hot pan? Yeah, because it very, when it's very fine, so it can be very compacted, the soil. Well. So it would then become difficult for the roots to penetrate. Yeah. So sometimes uh, the length of the roots also depend on the uh, uh, strength of the root. How easy it can penetrate this uh, Yeah. Uh, well, it's true that in, in some places where, where the, the soil compaction is very high mm -hmm. uh, because of, of use of, of the, the loss of, or, of, uh, of vegetal cover for prolonged periods of time or whatever, uh, roots are going to face with physical constraints in order to develop roots and, and, and well, to establish finally. So there are some other treatments much, uh, in, that involves uh, heavy machinery in order to get uh, uh, more porous uh, more porous soils and to facilitate the penetration of roots and also I'm going to talk at the end of this of this uh, presentation about organic amendments organic amendments has has been applied for a long time for improving soil pro physical properties so this could be uh, an alternative for reducing the strength of the soil to uh, hampering the, the development of roots. Okay. Well, uh, Apostolos, is a break or no break? Or we, uh, we can continue. It depends if you like or you can oh. ask the audience, of course. No, okay. that's why I asked, but small, uh, uh, I can... I can Five minutes, let's say. No, I, I don't know. Uh, Elena, what do you believe? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we must take a break. Hmm? Okay, a small one. Yeah. Okay. A small one. Okay. okay. Elena, you know. Well, the changes in the soil moisture content is evident, uh, although this uh, these uh, don't seem very uh, different uh, lines, they are. They are especially in the lowest, the, the driest part of the year. So mulching with this organic layer of, of brushes and, and chipped uh, biomass uh, increases soil moisture in relation to control, especially when water availability is lower. And in some species, like in this case Pistacia lentiscus, it improves the survival of the seedling uh, at the, let's say, short to medium term, two years. Okay, this, the, the uh, black symbols are mulching and the open symbols are without mulch. Okay. However, the growth of these three tested species is not improved. Uh, some uh, slide increases but not significant and even, oh sorry, it's a slight decreases with mulching uh, and even a significant one. So um, again it is a thing that is species specific because these other authors somewhere, oh, well Jimenez, well it was the, the reference of somewhere, uh, they found very clear impacts of the organic and a stone mulch on the survival of, in this case, Kerkusilex. This is the organic one, and this is uh, what they call uh, stone mulch. Well, I don't call this mulch, but stones. <laughs> but uh, the idea is that they recover uh, at eight or nine years uh, significant higher levels of survival of this whole moke in relation to a plant, normal traditional planting holes and also the growth 
as measured like leaf area. <coughs> but they didn't found effect on uh, soil water uh, moisture. They studied soil moisture at different layers and different uh, depth or, or horizons and in none they didn't found uh, an improvement on, on soil moisture. Again, some other things are affecting the, the, the sites, the species or both in order to uh, modify the survival. But they found some increases, uh, some improvement on soil fertility, especially regarding phosphorus. Look at the stone mulch, how improved phosphorus concentration at some deeper, uh, well, deeper, uh, below the shallowest uh, soil layers. This, this difference below 10 ppm of phosphorus to 20 ppm is a lot. It's a lot, in, especially in our systems where phosphorus is the main limiting nutrient in most of them. Not all of you, prob probably, but in, in most of the Mediterranean, uh, phosphorus is the, the most limiting However, nutrient. Uh, Alejandro Solitum, there are uh, also asking, um, do you consider that 20 ppm of uh, phosphorus is uh, enough for... Uh, mm, again, enough? I don't know uh, if it's enough. enough. Uh, let's say it's it's a good, from, uh, from our experience, yes. is good level of phosphorus. Good level, yes. okay. It depends also. This, uh, we are talking available phosphorus. Available, available. Available yeah. phosphorus, not total phosphorus. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I think so. Are you using a special kind of a stone? I, I I don't I don't think so. The, these are uh, blocks. I think they, they looks like uh, limestones, probably the, because I, I know the place where they did this this experiment. This is not our, our experiment, but I know the, this group, and the, the place is, is uh, calcareous. So probably these are big blocks of limestones. Okay. And mulching is very interesting in the case of, uh, of seedings. Yeah? In the case of uh, restoration or rehabilitation or whatever after fire, it is very interesting uh, technique because it protects the soil uh, that is the, the key uh, factor after a, a forest fire. Uh, protects the soils against the erosion and if you combine uh, mulching, oh, uh, you cannot see, well this, this plot is seeded, this is mulched and this is seeded and mulched. Okay? Uh, the idea is to, to protect the soil and to increase, to, to fasten, the, to speed up the, the recovery of uh, vegetation in order to protect more specifically and more effectively the soil. So mulching, it is a recognized technique to improve plant recovery, uh, reduce uh, soil loss, increase infiltration capacity, and reduce the resistance to penetration, especially in areas that have been affected by wildfires. And also increase soil respiration. This is very important because you know that soil respiration or the respiration of the soil, they are, they, it has two main components. One are roots and the other one are the microbial populations. And well, it is difficult at least, uh, this was not the, the objective of this study, to discriminate what, what proportion of this soil respiration came from the roots and what came from the microbes. But however, uh, mulching, these two treatments of mulching promoted the uh, activity of roots and microbes. And this is very important in order to, to, uh, to trigger the ecological processes. And now there is an ongoing project uh, called SUSTAFOR uh, with partners of, uh, I think it's uh, Belgium, France, Poland, Spain, I don't know. Well, uh, I don't know. 
Sustafor. And th this project is on ongoing, it's currently running, and they are trying uh, to develop uh, different mulch uh, treatments for planting seedlings and also soil conditioners. Soil conditioner based on um, on hydrogels. Okay. Well, we are not involved in that project, but this is a project that if you are interested on, on this type of treatments, you can check it in this website. And now, again, coming back to, to the field. Uh, well, uh, water is the most limited uh, resource for seedling establishment, so there are a challenge to uh, look for alternative sources of water. One of those can be fox. Uh, capturing fox is uh, a common practice at small scale in many parts of the world, like in California, Chile, Canary Island, in, in areas where they have uh, high mountains very close to the coast and the orography and other physiographic uh, features favors the uh, occurrence of this of these folks. This, this, in this case, this is in the region of Valencia, this is around 60 kilometers from the coast, and it is very common to find, to find this, this picture. This picture and this one, and this one, were taken in August the 3rd. Okay, and this is, is well, this is not common to have this in, in middle of August or the beginning of August. But, uh, well, I want to illustrate that there is a, a good place for trying to capture water from fox. In addition, in this area, we recover from fog 1,200 millimeters a year while by rainfall, direct rainfall, we only recover 466. These are liters per square meters, and these are liters by square meters, vertical ones, okay? And this is a, a, a I think, well, let's look this up. These are, remember at the beginning that we have uh, one in our center, a department of meteorology and climatology. This is uh, a work that has been conducted uh, by them. And they have a, a network, this is the region of Valencia, a network of different uh, stations where they are monitoring this uh, potential for capturing water from fox. And, uh, well, this represents, uh, the amount of water captured by a 18 square meter flat panel. This is the standard they use. The, the size of this panel is 18 square meters, vertical square meters. And this is the amount of water that in every site uh, they recover. Each tank is 1,000 liters. So, in a year. Exactly. There are areas with very high potential, especially this one. This is a tall sierra, very close to the to the sea, and captures a lot of, of a lot of water. And there are some others that don't. So, not all places are suitable for uh, the establishment of this of these systems. Well, this represents a challenge. Uh, to, it's very important to have water in the field, in the in remote areas, in rural areas, for whatever, <laughs> for planting, for for grazing, for fighting against fires. So it is very important, it, and this could be uh, a technique to 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 have water in those places. Well, we we use th that water in by what trying to identify watering or irrigation uh, treatments, minimum irrigation treatments. So we combine two different irrigation uh, uh, treatments, only one pulse, sorry, only one pulse, W1 of water, and two 
pulses. And also we combined this with a reduction of rainfall by covering the seedling before the, the rain. Well, we didn't observe, well, uh, we observed, sorry, an increase of, of the soil moisture uh, around a 10% uh, of the, the three, these three treatments in relation to the reduction of, of water. And this reduction, is, this increase in soil water content was translated in a reduction of the uh, survival. In this case, this is Pinus pinaster at Kerkus Idlex, and the reduction of, of, of rainfall uh, was the treatment that released the lowest survival rates. Okay, especially without compost. We, we will go to the compost component later. And irrigation systems, there are a lot. If you are interested in different irrigation, irrigation systems, check this reference, not only this, but several others by the same author, Bainbridge, that uh, they have, he has some manuals that describe very well all these techniques. Well, they, I, I put some of them, porous hose irrigation, deep pipe irrigation, perforated pipe irrigation, uh, weak irrigation, barrier clay pot also, and micro catchment. All of them imply extra inputs of, uh, inputs of external water, except micro catchments. <coughs> well, this is uh, uh, the porous hose, the commercial one. The idea is to put this, this hose, uh, you can play with the, the, the size of the porous uh, in order if you want a quick drainage or a more slowly one, to um, put this uh, vertical into the planting hole or whatever and fill it with water. This is similar. Uh, deep pipe irrigation, plastic or PVC tube uh, with one, two, three, or just uh, uh, one at the bottom uh, hole. In order, the idea is to direct the, uh, to to drive the the water directly to the root systems to reduce evaporation. This is the same per perforated pipe irrigation. Have a look at the places and, and the land, and these are not planting holes, but largest sites. And weak irrigation. Weak irrigation is the same. You put a wick connected to a tank, tank with water or a bottle with water, and the wick uh, could be a cotton or nylon or whatever, and um, just by capillarity is, is, uh, is driving the water from the tank to whatever you want to, normally to the roots. But, but is anything practical for a big uh, area of land? Well, they have done it here uh, for big lands, big, big pieces of land, yeah. This, uh, thing, this picture is in the Sonora Desert. They wanted to do a, a windbreak because they are also affected by very heavy winds, very strong winds. And um, yeah, they do it in a large, large parts of the territory. It is very easy because if you want to do this, just with heavy machinery, just dig the, the subsoil in or whatever to the depth that you, you want. And this, the, comp the really complicated is to do it in, in, in small pieces of land. Do it in, in large ones and um, flat ones like this, it's very easy. One what? One traditional activity in my country. What is? They use the, the pipe uh, made by clay. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm going Iran. with that. Yeah. What, what is your country? Iran. 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 1,000 years ago in arid area. Yeah. So clay, this is yeah. clay yeah. containers. Yeah, I, I'm going there. Yeah. yeah, good point. I want to, I want this reference to. Yeah. Okay, again, uh, micro catchment. I said that micro catchment is the one that it is not, not implied the application of 
uh, external water. The idea of a micro catchment applied to a planting hole, not to a catchment, a river catchment, by, but to a planting hole, is to collect runoff water and direct it to the planting hole, where is the, the seedling. Okay, that's the idea. There's uh, a planting hole or a bench with two small channels uh, that connect the, the slope to the seedling, okay? This is not a very good example because of the vegetation <laughs> just above the, the planting hole. Well, however, uh, we have some experience with the implementation of this micro catchment in, in, in dry lands. And we have used it uh, in these two species. And we have, well, in the case of Pinus alepensis, we didn't, we didn't recover any, any effect because the survival was very high in both cases. But in the case of Kirkus yeah, we improved the survival of this species. And in the case of Pinus alepensis, we improved the, the growth. <clears throat> and uh, these are works from another group in, in southern Spain, Spain that they have a, also a large tradition, a large experience during this, uh, using these techniques. In this case, this percentage are not survival, it's the opposite, it's mortality. Okay, in, the, in this case is uh, Pinus alepensis, and here Kirkus ilex, sorry, I didn't translate the the tables. The question is, again, well, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, or sometimes it doesn't matter. Again, remember that graph with the, uh, this uh, site-specific uh, component of the, of the survival. <clears throat> the question is that in semi-arid or in dry lands, 70% uh, of the rain of the rain, rainfall events is lower than 10 liters. So, and in our place, for instance, 90% of the rain events are lower than 10, 10 millimeters. So with this volume of water, do you think that we can produce runoff? It's very, depends on the intensity, but it's very strange. So micro catchment will work if they are runoff. If there's no runoff, they, has, they have nothing to collect. So what we did is trying to improve this micro catchment. Well, this represents a planting, a planting hole, normal traditional planting hole that try to increase soil water storage. And the idea of putting a water sh waterproof sheet, a uh, plastic sheet, above or upslope the planting hole will increase runoff. This, this sheet, well, this is a picture in the field. This plastic sheet is uh, completely waterproof and every single water, the drop of water goes uh, <coughs> downhill. The idea is to uh, put the, the plastic uh, sheet very connected to the seedling. And we can implement this plastic sheet with a dry well. A dry well is just a column in the planting soil, in the planting hole, a column filled with gravels, with small stones. And if you establish this dry well just when the, when the plastic sheet ends, you get that the, the runoff water goes inside and infiltrates towards uh, deeper soil horizons. Look at this picture. This picture was taken very uh, soon after a heavy rain event. This is a channel of the micro, one of the channels of the micro of the micro catchment, and this is the other one. This has the dry well, and this has not. So uh, water accumulates on the surface of this channel. And here, there's no accumulation because, because it infiltrates. Hmm? So in this case, 
uh, we are combining the increase of runoff and in increase of infiltration. And also, if we apply a mulch of stones, this, this is what I understand a stone mulch, not th these three other big stones, but this is my opinion. If we combine this with uh, a mulch of stones, of an organic mulch with uh, vegetal residues, well, we are also reducing the evaporation. Well, this is some picture too fast. Uh, the control normal planting bench. This is a micro catchment with the, you see the, the planting bench and the, ch the channels. Again, the improved micro catchment with the plastic mulch, sorry, the plastic sheet, and um, the micro catchment with the stone mulch. Well, this is like how we dig it, the, the, the implementation of the dry well. You open a, a trench, you put these are tree shelters, there are plastic tree shelters that are used like a, a model and then fill it with stones, uh, include this, this soil again into the hole and then remove, you, you pull up with these uh, plastics and this is what, how it looks like. And here, this picture is after the first summer in the field, we excavated the, the root system of some, of some individuals, well, with some, a lot of individuals, and uh, this is what we found in the dry well. Uh, uh, this is an accumulation of organic matter here. Uh, well, these are some, well, I think we are going to see later a picture, a, a better picture. Well, however, there were an accumulation of resources around the dry well. So we found it very interesting from several point of views. Oh, this is the picture. Okay, it was the same. Okay, this is the planted seedling that we recovered with the root systems. Okay, this is the, the, the dry well. And, well, this is better here. We even found higher uh, a tendency of the roots of the planted seedlings to go through towards the, the dry well. Okay. And probably this is what you call, okay. Well, this is again a deep irrigation. We also tested just a, 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 a plastic tube that goes 20 to 20, 25 centimeters deep in order to fill it with water. And this is buried clay pots. Yeah, this is also traditional in, in Spain. Maybe no thousand of years, but yeah. The idea, this is very interesting. Uh, also in the, in the references of Bembridge, you can find it uh, that they use it, the native Indians in America also use it, these clay, clay pots. It's the same, okay. Well, uh, it was funny because uh, well, when we, we order to, to produce these, these clay pots, we order, well, we want a hundred of these clay pots uh, with this size and this volume and so on. And the, it was a, uh, uh, say, a traditional man that did it in, 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 a, local, in a local place. So he asked us, why do you want it? Do you want to plant something uh, uh, beside? So this, is, this was something that they use it for producing watermelons and melons. Dry water? Yes. What's that? Because it's a new activity, but it's uh, just they are using for uh, house plants. Because, for example, one person would like to the holiday and leave the plant in the house mm. one week. Mm -hmm. And it needs water. And they produce one uh, uh, water, but it's not uh, liquid. <coughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Ah, gel. Yeah. If you put uh, here the uh, plant in the soil and uh, come uh, uh, to, to the soil with the liquid, change with the... Uh, yeah, this is, this are, ah, with temperature. But yeah. This is something like hydrogels. It's yeah. It's similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is this is interesting. The, the clay pots, I think, is a traditional, very interesting thing. However, it implies extra work, uh, extra input of water. You have to go there and irrigate. The question is that here is much more different than here because, well, in this case, we we how to say we waterproofed the other side of the of the clay pot because we didn't want the water to go at that side. We only wanted water from this direction, towards the planted seedling, not, not, not this side. And uh, well, the idea is that this is much more effective than this one because water uh, diffuses much more slowly, more, much more similar to plant water demands. Not the same, of course, because this is a clay pot, but uh, it depends the, the, the the diffusion of water from the plot for, from the pot to the soil depends on the of the soil water potential. Okay. Adam, uh, yeah. All these techniques, uh, I mean, adding water, giving input of water, is put for what period? The first summer or? Yeah, or? yeah, uh, yes. Uh, we are focusing always in the first summer, but however, if for instance you you may have a good first summer. So with uh, a drought period, a short drought period, and probably you found the, the seedling establishment is good enough. So, but you, mm, it is, I, I, I will go for the first summer always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because once the seedling is, has been established, uh, it is more independent of of the technology that you have applied. The roots may, be, may, may have gone uh, deeper soil horizon and are independent to extra inputs of water. And did you get any uh, difference in the morphology of the roots? With in the morphology, what do you mean? The to the distribution? The, the distribution, exactly. Mm, we, didn't, we didn't measure. Uh, we, th we know that uh, there was a tendency to, in the case of the dry well, to, to have much more roots uh, closer to the dry well that at the opposite. But we didn't, uh, we don't have numbers. But this is an impression. Hmm. Well, these are the, the processes related with water, with water that the different treatments with micro catchment, improved micro catchment, dry well, stone mulch, plastic mulch, clay pot, and watering uh, are affecting. But this work or not? Okay, that's the point. So we have some uh, some control plots, uh, well, plots where we control the the runoff, and well, there was taking into account all the rain events, we we found a tendency, not significant, to increase the amount of, of water reaching the 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 hole. But what was really interesting was if we only focus on the rain events lower than 10 millimeters, so the, the, the lower ones. Uh, and especially if we split them into low intensity events and high intensity events. In these higher intensity events, there was a significant uh, effect of the improved micro catchment, improved with the plastic sheet, in which we uh, recover two times the amount of water than in the control, much than two times. But in these lower intensity uh, events, between one and three millimeters per hour, the amount of water recovered was increased, was five times higher than in the control and even the micro catchment. The micro catchment has no, no effect at all. So this uh, simple technique improved. And um, well, this represents the soil moisture, uh, different uh, horizons at 10 
and 20 centimeters depth. Uh, this are in continuum uh, monitoring for the control of the improved micro catchment. And this is the, the, the events, the rain events. Okay. Look how this, well, obviously at 10 centimeters, the, the, the soil moisture respond faster than at 20 centimeters. For instance, those small rain events has a translation here, but not here. But however, at deeper soil horizons, there is a continuous during the, 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 the whole uh, year uh, till the end of the summer where the, the soil moisture is higher than in the control. And this integration, well, for instance, the, if we find, if we put a, a threshold of 7% of soil moisture, for instance, the difference between the control and the improved microcatchment micro is delayed 20 days. In these 20 days, uh, you increase the probability of having a good rainfall event. Very common at the end of, uh, this is uh, August, okay? So I think uh, this is very interesting for being, uh, improving the water conditions of our planting holes. And this of course has, well these are, the, the previous slide was an in continuum measurement of soil moisture and these are punctual measurements by TDR sensors. And well, of course, uh, comparison, improved micro catchment and control uh, is the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite. Okay, so the, the improved micro catchment uh, has higher uh, soil moisture than, than the control. And this has a translation into the water status of the plant. Uh, there is a very good relationship between the soil moisture and the relative water content of, in this case, was Olea europea seedlings, even the soil moisture at 15 or at 25 centimeters. And if we get the, this on average, the difference here in average is around 2%, okay? 2% maintained along the whole year. So if you move 2% in soil moisture in this line, you are moving from 4% with 60% uh, of, uh, of relative water content to here to 6, let's go uh, above 75% of relative water content. This is very, uh, a very significant improve in seedling ecophysiology. Okay. Well, and survival. Well, the, of course, we always replicate this in different sites to to reduce the, the side effects. This could be called the good side and this is the bad side or harsher conditions and better conditions. Here in this case, all treatments released a, a good per, uh, survival percentage, about 90%. And in these worst conditions, there were a significant good ex, uh, effect of clay pot especially and the dry wells as compared with the controls. The difference was between 64% here to 94% of the clay pot. I, I forget to mention that the clay pot was filled with water twice during the first summer, only twice. So it was the application of two and a half liters two times during the first summer. And the growth, the growth, same. Uh, just look at this difference between the control and the improved micro catchment. Well, this is again another two different locations. In all of them, in all the situations, don't, don't pay attention with that, uh, in all the situations, the improved micro, catch improved micro catchment release higher growth significantly. Okay, so in summary, at the very short term, water is the limiting factor. This is clear. But what happened in the short and medium term? Maybe nutrients? Nutrients could limit it or have some effect on, on, on plant establishment? Well, there are some evidences that our soils face with nutrient limitation. Uh, this is easy to, to test, like with uh, ingrowth cores of, of roots, with the proliferation of roots of natural vegetation. You just put some microsites that are enriched in whatever nutrient 
and at, from time to time you recover this, these bags and count and weigh the, 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 the biomass of roots. And what we found is that in limestone soils there's not much differences of uh, on limitation of nutrients of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in relation to controlled plants, uh, soils, sorry. But in marley soils, that is uh, highly carbonated soils, there is a very huge limitation by phosphorus and in lesser extent also by nitrogen. Okay. Uh, limestone soils and marley soils are very different, not only in properties but also in land use. Uh, in our place, marley soils, many, uh, a high percentage of the marley soils have been uh, cropped. So the disturbance there is higher than in limestone soils. So, so what about organic fertilization? If there's some limitation of soils, nutrient limitation of soils, what about organic fertilization? One alternative, well, of course, you always have inorganic fertilizers. This is an option. But we, we have been working for many years in the application of organic residues on restoration. Organic residues, mostly biosolids and municipal solid wastes, but also there's leaking manure, chicken manure, etc. These represent an important pool of organic matter and nutrients that, once applied to the soil, could improve microbial activity, the fertility of the soil and physical properties. But has negative effects, of course, like the heavy metals uh, content, organic pollutants and also pathogens. Um, this could be accumulated in the soil, contaminate aquifers and be transferred to animal plants and to the uh, food chain. Well, as I said before, we have worked in, in biosolids. Uh, this is sewage sludges. Uh, biosolids, as an average, has a 35% of, of organic matter, or of carbon, uh, around a 4% of nitrogen and around 2% of phosphorus. And the production of these biosolids has increased because of uh, European directives in the last decades. The question is that most of them, a large proportion of these uh, sewage sludge produ produced, is applied in agriculture. This includes some risks uh, for society. But there's still a, a pool that is uh, the final destiny is uh, landfilling or incineration. Well, uh, as I said before, we started working with, with these biosolids in 1997, starting with very low application roads, uh, rates because we were aware, we, we didn't want to, to create any contamination, uh, any, any problem, environmental problem. So uh, we used uncomposted biosolid from a, a um, wastewater treatment plant in a rural area, no industrial, so there was no problem with heavy metals and well, of course we, had the, we did the, all the analysis. And we applied just 10 tons per hectare, the, qui sorry, the equivalent to 10 tons per hectare. This, the equivalent in a planting hole of 40 by 40 by 40 was around 160 or 100 or so, uh, and 80 grams per plant of dry weight. Well, uh, 10 years after, after planting, we observe even a negative effect of the uh, application of biosolids on survival. This is not significant, but the trend was to increase mortality of the plants. This was related mainly to the increase in uh, salts, because uh, the organic matter, the, the composition of organic matter, well, biosolids has a lot of salts, 
and then the decomposition of organic matter releases more salts and this could be this could create a uh, uh, water stress to the plant and uh, but promoted growth especially of the of, of pine promoted growth dry sludge and liquid sludge look at this because they promote the growth of the uh, above ground biomass but not of the roots the roots you know if if the the roots find a good uh, place where with enough resources they don't go further they stays and um, how say and explore explode the resources and these other species Kercosilex well there was a trend both in increase above ground and below ground uh, below ground um, biomass in this case the behavior is different because Kercus has a tap root and the, um, it tried the, the, the life trait is to go deeper as much as possible from the nutritional point of view uh, it was also um, highlighted the phosphorus deficiency of, of the soils and especially liquid sludge for these two species was the best treatment in releasing this limitation. In addition, we measure uh, well if the nitrogen applied with the biosolid was uh, used by the plants. You know that the biosolids, the, the, this wasted because of the treatment in the wastewater treatment plant, all the processes, the sludge. It has a large proportion of 15 nitrogen so this could be like a, a tracer you can use this 15 nitrogen like a tracer and we uh, measure the 15 nitrogen con content of the leaves of these two species and we found that both treatment of, uh, of a sludge in Pinus alleripensis and Kercusilis increased the concentration of 15 nitrogen okay so the idea is that a large proportion between a 60 percent between a 40 and a 60 percent of the nitrogen that these plants took up from the soil came from the biosolids this was 20 months after planting uh, and regarding the water use efficiency by the delta 13 carbon well there was not much difference. The, the, the only difference that we found was between the two uh, application types of the biosolids in Pinus as the liquid sludge showed more negative values of, of the 13 carbon than the dry one. So less water efficient. Uh, the second, uh, the second uh, experiment was related with a, in an increasing application dose and two types of sludge, compost, composted or air dried. So we found that the higher uh, application rates, 45 and 60, was those that increased mortality, as we know, as we knew, that because of the salts. And, uh, but this intermediate application rates increase it was the most effective in increasing the the morphology of the of the pines well in this case i'm going to be a little faster how much time we have they understand you. <laughs> depends, uh, on the students. depends on the students <laughs> okay the idea is uh, we 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 found very to the, the first two years were very good from the uh, precipitation point of view but this follow a terrible year 2005 with very very uh, drought uh, stream droughts the question was that we found a decrease in the area um, basal area of the of the plants this was a combination this was because of a combination of Plants with compost, with, high, uh, with these rates of compost, grew better than the others, so were larger. 
uh, remember, larger with a lot of above ground biomass and low fruit biomass. So when it arrives this drought period, the plant was not uh, balanced. So there was a lot of transpiration surface and very little, well, or relatively little, uh, absorbent surface. So this was related with that, uh, a decrease uh, in, the, in the plant water potential and as a consequence, the basal area, you know that basal area includes both survival and growth, was decreased. This doesn't happen with the eye dried sludge. This always happens with the compost. Why? Because the compost, you know, the mineraliz mineralization of the composted material is much slower. So it is delayed in time. And in this case, eye dried sludge was almost completely mineralized once the, this uh, drought period uh, arrived. All these um, application dose increase the nutrition uh, nutrient uh, content of the leaves of the needles for nitrogen and phosphorus, and in this uh, vector uh, diagram we see. Well, I, I didn't mention before these diagrams relates the nutrient concentration, nutrient content, and uh, leaf weight and uh, always from a reference that is your control and in this case this line every every line represents one application rate so these two uh, 15 and 30 tons per hectare were the most effect effective ones by uh, eliminating this phosphorus deficiency while nit nitrogen was not deficient well this is again the same uh, view of the of the other uh, yeah. experiment. Yeah. yeah, and this question is uh, the combination of of the water harvesting uh, technique, this improved microcatchment, with compost, and in the in the release of phosphorus and the release of of potassium. We saw that. This is the release of the, the, the amount of phosphorus that in a normal soil the resins can capture. And uh, this is uh, in the planting hole with compost, and this in the planting hole with compost and with the improved microcatchment. The idea is that the combination of uh, the improved microcatchment and compost increase largely, although not significant the uh, amount of phosphorus delivered to the soil or released to the soil. Okay, and quickly go to the three shelters. Three shelters is another technology widely developed and widely applied. The idea of the three shelters is to reduce predation, to reduce uh, solar radiation, wind, reduce transpiration and increase uh, but increase relative humidity and also temperature. Uh, this is an example of uh, Olea Europea, two years after planting, protected by a tree shelter. This is another problem that has the tree shelters, that is when to remove the, the shelter. Um, well, it, one of the uh, first evidences is that those seedlings protected with the shelter grow faster. Grow, the height uh, growth is faster. And also in some, uh, in some plants, in this case, I think it was uh, Kirkusilex, was uh, significant also the increase in survival. Uh, there are different, different tubes. These are the tubes, um, well, this is the control this is a tube with holes, tube without holes, and this is a tube with, without holes and with removal in, in summer. Well, this is a lot, a lot of information, a lot of bi bibliography, uh, different types of, of, of tree shelters, sizes, uh, uh, 
double, double walls, uh, uh, plastics, different plastics, uh, or also organic ones. And well, it depends. You have to adapt what you want, what you need to what, uh, and you will find it for sure in the, in the market. When I said before, this is a, an increase. In one of the first consequences of tree shelters is an increase in height. This is an increase in growth. It's in a growth in height, but not in diameter. Basal diameter is reduced or remains the same, more or less the same. The consequence is a reduction in the uh, diameter by height ratio. And this could, try, this could bring some problems of stability of the seedling. And one other thing is the increase in temperature inside the tube. Mm? These are the, the average uh, in, uh, outside and inside the tube and the maximum outside and inside the tube in different, in different periods of time. So the increase in temperature inside the tube is very important. So, and this could collapse also the, the, the uh, physiological uh, functioning of the seedlings. That's why it is important to include some holes in the tree shelters. And, <coughs> and that's what this graph represents. This is the air temperature in a tube without holes in black and tube uh, with holes. So there's a reduction in the temperature inside the tube if, you, uh, if there are some holes in the, in the wells of the tubes, as well as the deficit of uh, water pressure, of wa wa water vapor pressure, okay? So if you apply, uh, if you are going to use tree shelters in a very dry and hot uh, situation, put some holes. So the limitation is that inside the tube, the temperature increase a few degrees, a few or more than a few degrees, uh, and the, uh, the efficiency, the, the physiological efficiency, uh, may decrease and even collapse. And also, there are some de uh, decreases in the root tissue ratio uh, that could hamper the the further uh, the further uh, performance of the plant. And also in moist conditions, if they have water enough, they could uh, grow a lot in, in, in hay and get, as a consequence, uh, weakening. So in general, yes, in summary, I promise, uh, in general, do all these technologies work? Remember this graph I showed you at the beginning of the talk that relating the, drought of the, the length of the drought period with seedling mortality with the planting uh, experiments that we established in the 92 and 93, so with very low implementation of technologies, just using the plants, the techniques, and the, um, and the production of, of nurseries that were available on these, these dates. And this is what an iteration of we are, have achieved in the the planting plots that we have established 10 years later, 10 to 20 years later. So look at the, 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 the slope of the, of the line is much lower. So we have, we have uh, improved a lot the success, well, not we, everybody. I mean, uh, the, the, the success of the reforestation, re restoration, sorry. And, and the idea is, can we go even low, further? So can we uh, flatten this, this line even more? Okay. Uh, finally, for, to conclude, there are, I want you to, to take this, these ideas. There are available ecotechnologies that allows for reintroducing native plants and recovery critical ecosystem functions for many Mediterranean drylands. Uh, on the other hand, higher inputs are required for highly degraded ecosystems. Uh, this also applies for countries. Uh, in the case of our countries, we need higher, higher uh, inputs for recovering our economies. So, uh, 
uh, higher stress conditions. And uh, ecotechnological tools should be adapted to site and species. But we need to understand the thresholds for cost-effective restoration, both in biophysical and socioeconomic terms. Okay. So this is a work a lot of people, not mine, people from the University of Alicante, from Theam, uh, well, maybe you, you know this guy, <laughs> this part of this. Okay. Thank you very much. So you have <laughs> any questions?